Good morning. I am Dr. D'Ambrosio, and I'm coming to you live from Chess Foundation, Chess Organization headquarters here in Glenview, Glenview, Illinois. I have a series of experts on women's lung health with me. To my left is Dr. Doss, who is a, a co-moderator with me for this session. And to my far right is Dr. Rivera. Next to her is Dr. Glassberg. And then right next to me is Dr. Hubert. We are going to be talking today about women's lung health. And Dr. Doss will start off with the first question. So when we think about some of the more common lung diseases, interstitial lung disease, which we'll explain in a little bit, asthma, chronic obstructive lung disease, lung cancer, are there any particular symptoms that we think of that we need to analyze more differently? Or are there certain diseases that are more common in women? So um, female sex is a risk factor for lung cancer, both in smokers and in non-smokers. Um, it's also a good prognostic uh, indicator. In other words, women tend to do better when they're diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. But we have to remember that women have a slightly higher risk of developing lung cancer. So on the downside, a woman might have a higher risk to have the disease, but on the upside, if they're properly diagnosed, they have a better chance of doing well. Yes. Yeah. And for COPD in particular, there's an increased prevalence or increased occurrence of COPD in women, especially those under 65 years old. And could you explain to us the difference between COPD and asthma? How are those different? So COPD tends to be predominantly a disease of um, uh, years of past smoking, um, where the airways um, get tight and sometimes the patient has wheezes or cough or shortness of breath. Asthma in particular um, tends to be more of a reactive airway disease with um, in between periods of flares where they feel well and their airways are well. But when they're unwell, their airways are very inflamed and for both asthma and COPD, it's, it can be very hard to get the breath out when there are flares at the disease state. So the symptoms are quite similar. Similar symptoms, wheezing, cough, shortness of breath. Um, and in particular, women um, tend to have higher levels of shortness of breath, higher levels of symptoms um, for the same degree of lung function compared to the man, compared to the male. So they're more likely to be more symptomatic. More symptomatic, also more anxiety and more depression in the, in the COPD disease state in women. So, so for women that yeah. get shortness of breath, we can also include the, the tissues of the lung, right? The outside. So if we think about what Dr. Hubert said with the tubes being asthma and the COPD, the chronic obstructive disease affecting the tissues and breaking them up, what happens in interstitial lung disease is it's actually the tissue structure. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're broken up, but that they actually, there's almost like cement that gets inserted. Mm -hmm. And as it, the diseases get worse, there are 300 of these diseases now that we recognize. And as they involve more of the bases of the lung, there's more trouble with oxygen. But there is clearly a difference amongst these diseases in terms of who gets them in terms of men and women. And we know that this can switch when they develop lung disease with underlying diseases. I know we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. But it's really interesting, the difference in, in women and men. I think the biggest problem in, in interstitial lung disease is that it takes too long to make the diagnosis. And we can talk about that in mm -hmm. all of our fields. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, for, for my patients, it, it, it'll take maybe three or four doctors before they ever get the right diagnosis. And, Lots of them, no offense, Dr. Hubert, but they'll get labeled with your disease, right? They'll say, oh, that patient has COPD because, it, you know, this woman's short of breath and she has a dry cough. And they may not even get a chest x-ray right. for your disease. So it's just taking too long to get them diagnosed. But I think it's very important that we have an awareness uh, as patients and as people of the diseases and how they affect different parts of the lung. And that these symptoms, you know, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, are very nonspecific. I mean, really, it could be allergies, it could be asthma, it could be COPD. It could be that you're, you know, didn't exercise for the past years or you're feeling tired and fatigued. But the problem is that more women are more likely to get labeled with another disease, like asthma, without ever having the appropriate test to show that they have asthma and or a chest x-ray right. to show that this their lungs are not scarred or that they don't have lung yes. cancer. This has been studied actually. So where 
um, a case in particular was presented to um, over 190 primary care physicians with nonspecific symptoms, shortness of breath, wheeze, and many of the women were called asthma mm -hmm. and many of the men were called COPD. So for the same set of symptoms and the same disease process, COPD in particular, many of the women may actually be labeled asthma when it could be COPD. So why is that important? Um, for treatment purposes, I would say, for the most part. So the treatment's different between those two diseases? Treatment can be very different. For, yeah. for patients with interstitial lung disease, I don't think it's so much about the treatment now. Um, it's more about just getting the patient recognized and labeled and maybe getting that patient enrolled in a clinical trial, being able to present what we need because there's so many of these diseases we really don't have a treatment. Um, but the delay, you know, is a, the average is 11 months to 12 months, about a year before they actually get labeled correctly. And they have to see several physicians, as I've mentioned. So we need to promote the awareness. I, and, and would I you think, agree it's getting the right time? Sorry. Yeah. Right. No, I just for lung cancer, yeah. Uh, it's more critical than that. It's about the stage of yes. the, the lung cancer. So you want to diagnose lung cancer at an early stage where we have more that we can do in terms of curing that patient. Um, and it's a problem if you have a cough or shortness of breath or you're coughing up a little bit of blood and it's six months before you get an x-ray. I would argue that for interstitial lung disease, although there aren't um, specific treatments, but you know, oxygen is a really important intervention. And if you are lacking oxygen, you may not know, and it could put a strain on your heart. Um, and I think getting the right testing and the right diagnosis is important regardless of the disease that you're talking about. Maybe the, the message is really don't ignore your symptoms. Yeah. And that, um, as if you're if you're sensing that you're short of breath and if even if you may not even have a dry cough yet or a wet cough you have a symptom that symptom is real and let's prove it right mm -hmm. let's go out and find out right. what we need to do to make that diagnosis so establishing with a primary care or a, a lung specialist um, I think is really important in that follow-up that longitudinal care yes is equally important um, so that the doctor can follow over time we know in COPD that women are partic in particular um, have um, higher uh, health care utilization for COPD flares they end up in the emergency department more um, and in the hospital more higher rate of hospitalizations and they report that um, they have some delays mm -hmm. in follow-up at times. So right. we want to make sure we establish them, take a, a detailed history, and make sure we're attending to their symptoms, but then follow them over time longitudinally to hopefully help keep them out of the hospital and out of the emergency department too. When we think about these diseases, are there different ways that women present with the disease? Or when I say present, I mean, do they have different symptoms or do they have different risk factors than men do? So are they at different ages? Do they have, you know, more or less exposures to different kinds of environmental things? Maybe I can talk about this with the interstitial <coughs> lung thing. So let's take patients with rheumatoid arthritis, right? Um, not all these women will present necessarily with the joint findings that everybody thinks about with rheumatoid arthritis. But if they do have that, right, we know that once they develop lung disease, right, the course of the disease is different. So they will have, you know, they will have more aggressive disease, but it's interesting. It actually turns out that more men with rheumatoid arthritis, about three times the number, develop lung disease. So there's a switch, right? But what happens also, I think, with presentation, I think it's a very good point, Dr. Das, is that women will have other findings perhaps on their hands, and the doctors don't look at their hands. The women will notice that they're getting some kind of roughness in their skin, right? These are signs of other related, what are called autoimmune diseases that are treatable. We have treatments, right? We may not necessarily cure them all, but we can certainly, unlike what you're able to do, right, with early stage disease. Even in our early stage disease, we can't necessarily do that, but the recognition is key because that's what's gonna help us in the future to be able to develop those treatments. But I do think it's important that it may not just be the shortness of breath, it may not be a dry cough, it could be other findings, and it will be different between uh, women and men. I think for lung cancer, I wouldn't say that symptoms are different. I think men and women present with the same symptoms. I do. Uh, think that the biology 
of the of cancer is different in men and in women and I think there are a lot of uh, potential reasons why women may be more at risk in particular why when a non-smoker develops lung cancer it's more likely to be a woman than a man and that may have something to do with hormones estrogen and progesterone it may have something to do with the way women repair damage to our DNA which happens every day every second our cells are being um, uh, challenged then we have the capacity to repair those small little uh, fragments of damage but women may not have a, a robust DNA repair capacity. There are many different uh, potential reasons why lung cancer uh, risk is higher in women, including, of course, tobacco. But when you look at tobacco and lung cancer in women, women tend to be younger um, when they present with lung cancer and have smoked less. So there's a lot about the biology of the disease that we don't understand, but the symptoms are the same the shortness of breath, a persistent cough, and you're just lingering, it won't go away, back pain or just fatigue, weight loss, that should alarm both women who smoke and non-smoking women to just get referred to the right doctor, a lung doctor, and get testing. And for COPD, um, maybe we've already touched on this, but symptoms are the same men and women, uh, symptoms being shortness of breath, cough, wheeze potentially, but women experience a higher degree or uh, more significant symptoms, more significant shortness of breath um, when they're surveyed or asked about their symptoms. Their mm -hmm. symptoms are the more... Severity. The it's severity. A, a very, dis dis the severity. Disabilitated, more yeah. more yeah. Right. Right. right, for the same level of lung function right. compared yeah. to the men. So um, symptoms are, are significant and then higher depression, higher anxiety mm -hmm. levels, which may in fact be precipitating some of the, um, or a comorbid condition to the recurrent admissions right. and hospitalization. So um, I think that's a bit of a symptom difference there. Um, same symptoms, but to the a higher degree, degree yeah. in, in women. Right. And then in terms of background or risk factors, which we were touching on, for women worldwide, uh, burning uh, biomass fuel mm -hmm. indoor is mm -hmm. a very real risk factor. So cooking. Cooking. Cooking, yep. cooking yep. indoor. Cooking indoors. Which has also been linked right. to lung cancer risk. Right. And that's sure. a huge risk when we talk yeah. about outside of the Wood US. Wood-burning right. stoves. Mm -hmm. Wood-burning stoves. Wood right. burning right. stoves. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. so, well, stoves. with the large immigrant populations, uh, we do sometimes find them using cook stoves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think we're in the United States and everyone either cooks with gas or electricity, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so that you should think about it in somebody who's new to the U.S. Mm -hmm. or lives in a, an underserved population that there may be other exposures we would not normally think about. Mm -hmm. Yep. You said something before that I think was really important, so I want to make sure that we understand it. You, were you suggesting that a woman who has never smoked really might still, if with the right symptoms, could develop cancer and should not consider herself risk-free for lung cancer. Oh, that is true. So 85% of lung cancers diagnosed are linked to tobacco. There's no question. That is the most important risk factor. But about 15%, uh, I think that's the right figure, of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer are never smokers. Now, there's it's complex, eh? because what is the risk of a secondhand exposure. We know it's it's there. What are the environmental risks? But if you've never smoked cigarettes, you may still be diagnosed with lung cancer or develop lung cancer, both women and men, more common in women. So it's important and it, you know, simple tests like a chest x-ray. Uh, it's a it's a test that even a primary care physician can order. And women should be empowered to say, uh, should I have, I would like to have more tests, uh, an x-ray, breathing test you know, laboratory tests, you know, check my oxygen level. Um, because I think, well, for lung cancer in particular, it is so important diagnosing disease, that disease early. But even for diseases in where you may not have much that you can offer, some interventions like oxygen and exercise um, and enrolling in a clinical trial are critically important. Pulmonary rehab. Pulmonary rehab, yes. exactly. Especially for, yeah. So <laughs> let me address this a little bit. So of the worst forms of interstitial lung disease, they are in people who have smoked. So 80% of them are ex-smokers and 80% of them are men for the most part. So our data is a little different, right? Mm -hmm. 
yet smoking is clearly a risk factor. Right. Um, and if we look across the board at populations across the world, no one's ever going to tell you it's a good thing to smoke. I think here you have an additional risk factor when you don't smoke as a woman to get a disease. We don't have that in the interstitial lung disease world. So for example, um, patient gets told they have pulmonary fibrosis, they type it on the internet, they immediately assume they may have what is the worst form, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the rarest, it is about 55% of this 300 that I talked about. But there are a whole host of other of these diseases that will cause pulmonary fibrosis. And Dr. Revere is absolutely right. As that disease progresses, the best drug is oxygen. Probably one of the best things we do is send them to pulmonary rehab. And we all should probably should test for sleep. Right. Yeah, so we know that there right. are all these interstitial, interstitial lung disease. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. like these comorbidities are out yeah. there. The cardiac disease that oh, gets yes. ignored as yes. well. So somebody will have, let's say, an abnormal x-ray, interstitial lung disease. It's a gentleman or a woman in their 60s or 70s. They may have high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And nobody's done a stress test. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I just had a gentleman come in and see me who had, you know, he said, you saved my life. I said, well, what did I do? He said, well, I, I had three stents placed and I can walk again. Yeah. So we also have to be aware lung disease is great. It'll capture people. You need to be att attending to your symptoms because there may be mm -hmm. other things that get picked up right. in addition to your lung disease. And there's some literature that supports that women's symptoms may be less likely to get worked up than men's yes. symptoms, right? right? So I mm -hmm. think as a woman in particular, we need to be really proactive about bringing our symptoms. So if I have interstitial lung disease and I'm still dyspneic and I'm having some chest pains and I have some other symptoms, make sure that I bring that to the forefront right. so that so that, that you gets addressed. Right. Exactly. So if you have heart disease, it's right. It, and yeah, that happens a lot with COPD. Yeah. I think yeah. women can tend to minimize their symptoms mm -hmm. and yeah. get busy with home life <laughs> and other multi Because we have a million hats. A million hats. <laughs> and we have different symptoms of cardiac yeah. disease. Right. So yes. it, it's definitely there. I think also women need to not only keep bringing their symptoms to their doctor, but if they feel that they're not getting relief of those symptoms, to consider second opinions. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Sure. Yes. sure. Absolutely. Because uh, every physician is capable of uh, not seeing something or not realizing something is there. And a second set of eyes is always helpful um, on a patient who isn't getting better with traditional yeah. medicines. And I think if you have a primary care physician who's been following you for these common symptoms that can yes. be seen in many conditions, I mean, thyroid disease can make you short of breath. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Heart disease can make you short of breath. Your short it's, of breath is real. Right, it's yes. real. So right. you can ask for a you know, the two most common organs to cause shortness of breath are going to be the lung and the heart. So ask, should, I'd like to see a lung doctor. And typically when we see people with shortness of breath, we think about, is it in the spongy part of the lung? Is it in the tubes of the lung? Is it in the heart, the right heart, pulmonary hypertension, causing people to have shortness of breath? So when we think of shortness of breath, we think about n neuromuscular diseases, right? Uh, myasthenia gravis. We, I mean, I think lung doctors in particular think about shortness of breath m and take it to many different organs. At least that's been my experience. Sort of an algorithmic approach right. based on symptoms and then additional data. So pulmonary function testing, x-ray, sometimes lab No work. assumptions. No assumptions. No assumptions. Right. No assumptions. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. And you, and systematically, okay, this is not the lungs because I've done an x-ray or a CAT scan mm -hmm. and I've done breathing tests and I've looked at the heart. So maybe this is coronary artery disease and an echo isn't good enough. Maybe you should have a stress test or maybe that's your thyroid. Maybe you're anemic. Maybe you're deconditioned. But I think that that's the, the benefit of thinking about these symptoms that are so common to so many disorders and potentially, and sometimes you don't find an answer, but that's okay Better as long as look. you have excluded right. any potential disease that can be treated. Right, and don't wait too long. I think that's the other piece. Don't wait. You have a symptom and you don't feel like yourself, don't wait. Go find out. As women, we tend to put everybody else yes. before us, right? right? Yeah. Our children, our husbands, our friends, our parents, we're always, we're, we often but, tend to be the caregiver. But I also think that the healthcare system, um, yeah. you know, has, has biases. And I think, um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, biases in the workplace, biases here. And I think there are biases. 
and women perhaps are not taken as seriously and it's anxiety it's depression it's this it's that um, so I think it's the individual person putting things off but also the healthcare system may work against us yeah. we I see mean, a corollary too with socioeconomic status yes, so yes, very important uh, higher uh, rates of or higher prevalence I should say of COPD in the poor in yes. particular and in it, it's it's proportional so the more poor um, or the lower income higher COPD range so I think that's important that's and that's where we see a uh, significant smoking history too I think there's some demographic variability too there's higher rates of COPD and smoking in the southeast and Appalachian areas too oh, yeah. but we know that there's a correlation with low socioeconomic status and, and access to and care. And cigarette co companies yes. are very savvy and they know how to target mm -hmm. the underserved population, Hispanics and blacks uh, in particular. And there was a study that was published last year that looked at the number of um, sites or these little uh, convenience stores next to um, gas stations mm -hmm. that sell cigarettes and the, they were more likely to be found in areas where there was more of an underserved population. In addition, the location to schools is higher um, in, in areas uh, where you know, the, the socioeconomic status is, is low. If we look at e-cigarettes, from oh, where oh they yes. put Let's the talk small about that stores. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we need to we need to spend a little bit of time on e-cigarettes and, yeah. and there's and so much yeah. information. Tobacco yes. in general, yeah. are there differences in trends with tobacco use among women versus mm -hmm. men? Part one. And then part two is is what about smoking cessation? Do what are the rates of smoking cessation and what can we do as providers to make sure that we are engaging them at the time that we can to really work on that as a prevention measure? So I think that social history is probably the first piece. So making yeah. sure that we've uh, taken a history and known how long they've smoked for. I sometimes ask whether whether the spouse mm -hmm. smokes yes. or the partner smokes because if we're going to talk about quitting, it's helpful to quit together. Who else in the household? Who else right. in the house smokes? Right. So that history is important, and for how long they've smoked, um, just to kind of outline their risk for the disease process. Um, and then um, we can go into talking about e-cigarettes and that too, but I know we've seen um, uh, the d a decline in smoking cigarettes for yes. both men and yep. women, though COPD prevalence has gone up. Um, yeah, it continues to rise continues despite that. to rise. There's some variability year to year, but... Hey. Um, I do think that the decline, women started smoking cigarettes after the 1960s, right? Yes. Significant rise. Mm -hmm. And while it's plateaued Virginia and it's... Slims, right. Right. Yeah. Um, Vogue there. Right. We We've come a good. long way, baby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. And there is now a decline in, in other countries. So if you look at Asia and Africa and Latin America, uh, the, the rise in tobacco uh, use in women is really significant. Um, and we have to remember, at least for lung cancer, that lung cancer kills more women each year than breast cancer, uterine cancer, and cervical cancer combined. Yeah. So it is. Say that one more time. Yeah, say that, please say that one more time. Lung cancer yeah. uh, is the second most common cancer in the United States. Breast cancer is still more common in women, but it kills more women each year than breast, uterine, and ovarian cancers combined. Yeah. And it is now the leading cause of death, not only in the United States, but in many other uh, countries um, throughout the world. And that's really important. Most people don't know that, eh? No. They think that breast cancer um, is the most common yep. cause of cancer death. Most women survive breast cancer. Right. Um, so I think uh, the, the, you know, there was a really nice paper that was published very recently that looked at trends in tobacco, and it is coming down for both men and women but not in the underserved population. That's really unfortunate. Um, but in terms of benefit, the benefit from quitting cigarettes is from day one, right? You, your ability to mobilize secretions in your air tubes is improved by day one. And right? your improvement in lung right. function over five years. Exactly. We have those beautiful right? graphs True. we all right. show all the time right. of how much better you can get. And but studies have shown that women actually benefit more from quitting smoking. Um, it's difficult because of all the issues related to weight gain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the benefit of cigarettes I, is that they're a mood elevator and they curb <laughs> your appetite. 
Um, and but some that's people, it. that's it, that's it. Right. And you can get those they benefits. Don't look cool. No, right. no, they <laughs> do not look cool. And, and, and unfortunately, <laughs> women have been targeted. They've been targeted with that message, right? Virginia Slims. It's the sex appeal. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that we have to um, do it. What we do in our different worlds within lung diseases is critically important. But I think you, you started this um, discussion with the umbrella of tobacco, right? And the risk and how we have to advocate uh, for tobacco treatment and tobacco counseling. Which is something that Chess has done so, I mean, they have yeah. yeah. really have dedicated so much time and research and, and resources to, yeah. to help empower providers and patients um, to quit smoking. I like to add to that, too, for, for women and men, the benefit, I know we're all lung doctors here, but um, the benefits of quitting smoking are more than just to reduce lung cancer risk and yes. COPD, but to just, I, I tend to, in the clinic, tell patients that reduces their risk of heart disease and stroke, oh, too, yes. just yes. to yes. added yep. benefit. Bladder cancer, breast Everything. cancer, head and neck yep. cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, Everything. osteoporosis, yeah, your skin, <laughs> skin. Looks better. yes, everything. Um, so there's lots of benefits. Yeah. Uh, and not to mention the heart, and it's, it's really impactful. Um, did you want to talk any more about e-cigarettes at all? Yeah, I, so, I didn't really know, touch on that too much. Yeah, so e-cigarettes came on the market, and I think uh, we initially thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be great. We're going to get everybody off cigarette tobacco, right? Mm -hmm. And they're just going to have e-cigarettes. But what happened? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, <laughs> and it's not a good thing. The actual yeah. heat from the e-cigarette um, is actually much higher than the regular cigarette. So what happens is, is that the you know the kids around the school corners that you mentioned are, are buying these things or they're online mm -hmm. my, my right. son will yes. tell me all about what's available mm -hmm. online and how easy it is to get and they don't need their parents to sign off and they on come it. in they different flavors click. yeah they yes. really yes. flavor yeah, really flavors are going to get eliminated yeah. i think with yes. some special right. warning right. but the heat actually is so damaging to the yes. airway that we don't even know what's going to happen to our information about lung mm -hmm. cancer, our information about other related lung damaging diseases over the next decade, that we have people, you know, inhaling and vaping and doing whatever with stuff that's burning them, yeah. literally. I mean, and, we, and I, you know, uh, years ago I had an attending who said, one of the doctors I worked with said, anything that burns is bad. Yes. Right. And yes. here we go. Right. This and is it. Food, it, burns. Food is it causes cancer, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you over barbecue your food, it is a, a risk factor for cancer. Right. We won the battle on teenage smoking. We really dramatically changed it. And then until, now. until the e cigarettes until the jewel came, came out. Until, yes, exactly. We, and so we now know that they help us yeah. to quit smoking cigarettes, yeah. but we're it's so damages are pretty effects. expensive. We don't yeah. right. The concern is even dosing too. Like one of the new jewel pods, people can smoke it. It's not like going through a pack and you have to take the time to smoke the pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Kids are not monitoring the amount and have gotten toxicity because of the high amounts of nicotine Oof, that right. they've gotten in a very short period of time because right. they're not controlling for it. Right. That's too That's too bad. Yeah, it's that's really, really it's very important. Is there any of rates of women versus men starting vaping? And, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with any I think that teenagers, data. it's at an epidemic proportion. I do know that uh, teenage girls are more likely to smoke than teenage boys, but really the rate of smoking has gone down. And um, actually, I was uh, I was with my daughter, who's 16, at the dermatologist, and the dermatologist said, "I don't even ask about smoking anymore," because she knew I was a lung doctor. She says, "I asked them if they vape." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, no teenager smokes anymore. Yeah. So now we have a new uh, problem new that problems. we have to address for lung health. In addition yeah. to what they're vaping, because exactly, they can right. vape THC, yes. yeah, well, right, right. That's formaldehyde, the other part, right? Right. which is a whole exactly. other oh, whole Lord. another issue. Exactly. So that actually brings up a great point because several states have made marijuana legal, um, and uh, I certainly have patients who think smoking marijuana is just fine. Any. So uh, again, I'll tell you about pot diseases. lung. Yeah, so, so this we have great. pot lung, right? Yeah. So when they smoke, uh, it's it's not a clear product. It's made up of a lot of very bad things that are in it. And so in the world of lung tissue diseases and the interstitium, they get pot lung, and they can get nice big nodules. Um, actually, have a patient who was working who noticed that he was getting short of breath, couldn't figure it out, and he actually was allergic 
to a component we were able to identify in the pot that he was buying. Yep. And uh, he ended up with nice big nodules, and he's actually going to have to have a lung transplant. Amazing. So wow. you're, it's not so safe. Right. right. What exactly. about outcomes in these different diseases? Just change gears yeah. a little bit and bring yeah. it sort of back. Are there major differences in the outcomes of, say, COPD, asthma, ILD, yes. and lung cancer for a woman versus a man? And do we need to treat them differently and sort of think about them differently? And, and are the treatment courses different for some right. of them? So for women in particular, uh, female sex is associated with a better outcome, regardless of the stage of lung cancer, a stage according to uh, where it is. So regardless of the stage, women do better. What's critically important, we don't treat um, women differently than men in terms of the chemotherapy or the agents we use, but what's critically important for non-smoking women in particular or patients who are diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the lung, that's the, that's the cancer that occurs in non-smokers, but it's also the most common type of lung cancer that is diagnosed in even in smokers, regardless of, of their smoking history, these tumors must be tested for uh, specific genetic mutations, if you will, because finding a specific genetic mutation and using a medication that targets that mutation has the best outcome uh, at any stage of disease. Um, in women, uh, non-smokers, Asians, adenocarcinomas are more likely to harbor these mutation. So I think patients, regardless of their sex, but particularly women, should be empowered to say, you know, have you tested my tumor for these mutations? And you don't have to know what they are, but just know that they're tested because now most people send out these uh, tissue specimens to laboratories that do an entire panel of testing. Mm -hmm. So you can get a whole host of, uh, of different genetic mutations. And every day a new drug is being developed. Um, so it's very important, but the outcomes are slightly better. Female sex over the decades has been associated with a better outcome for lung cancer. So for m many of the interstitial lung diseases and for pulmonary fibrosis, women do better. Um, some of the other diseases, they're only seen in women, and so we can't complain, we really can't compare women and men because we know that it's really when they're diagnosed. And we don't have these markers like you do. We've looked at telomerase, which many people get as an aging gene, right? And we know that, that a lot of it is that women seem to be protected, right? They have not as active telomerase, so the disease isn't as aggressive. Um, and in terms of outcomes, we think for most of them, except for those that are just exclusively women, um, women tend to do better. So they're in the hospital less. Right. Uh, in the clinical trials, you know, it's really important that more women enter these mm -hmm. trials. Yes. Because for the field I, I spend most of my day in, uh, there often we can't get enough women right. in the trials. Mm -hmm. And so we need to encourage both get an early diagnosis, go early to your doctor, and also ask, what are the avenues for things that don't have recommended chemotherapeutic right. regimens or inhaler regimens? What else can I do? And empower themselves to, to seek that information. Which goes back to making sure you get in a clinical trial if a trial is available. Absolutely, Absolutely. even in lung cancer, you, yeah. whenever a trial, yes. being in a clinical trial has been shown to be associated with a better outcome, period, yeah. yes. right. yeah. than not in That's a clinical right. trial. Not to mention the fact that if you don't have um, enough women um, or enough uh, blacks or Hispanics in these trials, you don't know how these drugs are different. Right. Yep. Yep. What dose, the dose in men may be very different than the dose needed in women. The side effects of the, how we process these drugs in our bodies is very, may be very different. And this is a problem in studies, correct? Yes. Clinical trials often don't have enough women in them to gain this information. And minorities. Yeah. And, and minorities. minorities. So for the only way for us to learn about these outcomes and what we can do is to make sure that everybody yeah. goes early, right. Right. gets Go involved, early. Yeah. get involved right. in your problem, right? Recognize yeah. what it Absolutely. is. We talked a little bit already about COPD and how they do in terms of higher rates of hospitalizations, exacerbations, more emergency room visits, um, increased healthcare utilization and cost. So I think we, we sort of touched on that earlier. They tend to have higher or more severe symptoms, mm -hmm. more dyspnea, more anxiety. And women are more likely to have COPD to begin with, correct? Like 37% yeah, higher right, than, right, than right. men. Yeah. Yes, more prevalent, especially 
less than 65, but even over age 65, too. And we have and to remember that. Relatives. And in first degree pain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about and family. Right. 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 Family, family history is yes. key. Yes. Family right. history is key. Yeah. It, it is a risk factor for lung cancer. If, you, if an individual has a first degree relative, with lung cancer, particularly if that first degree relative is a woman. Yes. And the other Same thing. Same for COPD. I'll right. just piggyback on That's important yeah. is that emphysema and lung cancer go together. Yeah. So does and pulmonary fibrosis. Exactly. Yeah. So 10% so of the patients right. that will develop pulmonary fibrosis will develop lung tumors. Right. It, it likes to go into the tissues that right. are all degrading there and being right. irritated. Exactly. So I think if, you know, the, and it's been studied that women with emphysema. Uh, and have a higher risk of lung cancer than men with emphysema. So even more reason to think if you have been diagnosed with COPD and you have an x-ray that suggests or, uh, or, or the marker, or you, the, your doctor thinks it may be not just chronic bronchitis but emphysema, if you develop new symptoms, a worsening cough, more shortness of breath, ask about should I be tested for other conditions that may be related or linked to emphysema. And have you actually been tested for that? If you've been told that yeah. you have COPD or emphysema and you've never had breathing, breathing tests, test, you've or never had pulmonary right. function, you get that done. Exactly. Can you also, I think we also should remember that most of what gets labeled with this term may not be COPD. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the symptoms of shortness of breath yes. really need to be pursued. Don't be content with, well, you know, just because you smoked, you got this. Right. You but know, maybe you, you have something else wrong, right? Exactly. Right. COPD is definitely a common label for a, just a, a general shortness of breath yes. symptom that is sometimes not real well defined. How often right. in your clinics do you have patients who come in with that label and you say, well, I don't see breathing tests here at this institution. Have you ever had them done? And they say, no. no. I would yeah. say it's, it's very, very common, common. common. that yeah, patients have that common. diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Without ever having it, or, or asthma, or asthma, asthma. 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 A lot without of asthma. ever having uh, lung function tests, which are available everywhere, yeah, every hospital. They're standardized. Yeah. They're easy yeah. to do. Yep. A lot of clinics just do these little handheld spirometers. So right. for for interstitial lung disease, you really need you the, the whole complete right. test that includes yeah. sitting in this little box with a plastic door. Right. 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 That that where we get actually the volumes of your lungs right. so we can better right. understand yeah, what you have. It helps us to differentiate if it's a lung or a tube problem, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. My yeah. favorite. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> sponges and tubes. Yeah, yeah sponge and tubes. <laughs> That's right. I, had a thought. Yeah. I hadn't touched on asthma a whole lot earlier, right. yeah. but there is a disease state that's been more recently defined, the asthma COPD overlap yes. syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I, I should mention to ACOS that um, women um, are overrepresented in that category. So. Um, it's it's not predominantly disease of women, but there's definitely more women compared to men that suffer from that. So which who is both have asthma and COPD. And, COPD. Yes. and those um, patients tend to have definitely a, a more severity of symptoms, more flares of their disease process. Um, depending on which literature you read, a, a higher rate of decline in their lung function, more rapid decline in their lung function. So uh, maybe another plug for getting lung function tests done mm -hmm. and uh, see what you have. Right. Sure, to have the right, the correct label. Yes. I just wanted to ask, we've been focusing appropriately so on lung function testing and x-rays and but what about sleep? <laughs> Enlighten us about sleep. So, well, I think, I, I would think a little bit that <laughs> Sleep disorders in general, or specifically sleep apnea, are more common in men than women. However, as providers, we don't think about it in women, right? right. When we think of sleep right. apnea, we think an overweight or overweight older male. Right. But women can have it, and especially there's a higher prevalence when you have interstitial lung disease. In fact, yeah. there's some recent literature by Dr. Redline questioning could untreated obstructive sleep apnea actually could be causal in, yeah. in uh, interstitial lung disease. Yeah. And we don't know which direction, that may be a bi-directional bi relationship. Similarly with COPD, untreated sleep apnea at night can significantly, that's another overlap syndrome, yeah. right? right? Significantly affect symptoms and potentially, and we, and we don't have, this data actually is more controversial whether or not it changes outcomes, right? Long-term treating right. comorbid sleep disorders. Um, but if you have 
persistent symptoms, starting even with an overnight oximetry, if you're still desiding at night. Yeah, you know? just checking your oxygen at yeah. night. Right. That's uh, easy that, for then any maybe doctor you need to have another test. And the yeah. women, in and meta women. women, menopausal women, yes. may be at higher risk. That's Much when higher the risk. prevalence goes up for sleep apnea, and the risk of cardiovascular, meaning heart, problems from untreated sleep apnea is higher in women after the age of menopause than in men. So there's enormous benefit to getting sleep evaluated yeah. when you are having symptoms of shortness of breath or if you have underlying lung disease. Yep. Even, you know, I, even with I, no um, weight change, right? Right, yeah. right. You're Without 20% any, right. more likely to develop, to have sleep apnea at the exact same body mass index right. post-menopause yeah. versus prior. And so, uh, the symptoms of sleep apnea, of this fatigue and just feeling yeah. tired all the time and yeah. You know, yep. women think, oh, that's because I'm doing too much and I'm not getting enough. Right. Or they get diagnosed right. with depression. Yes. Um, right. Or it's my ILD or my right. COPD right. and it's right. just because I have right. this So I think it all goes back to the story of oxygen, right? <laughs> and, and perhaps the best drug we all give. Yeah. yeah. Um, regardless of, of what it is, is if our oxygen drops below the levels that we know are needed. Um, and we don't want to give oxygen to be used, you know, all the time just because you're short of breath or. I feel short of breath, so then I'm going to need the oxygen. That actually doesn't correlate at all. It doesn't go together. It actually has to be measured. But I think in sleep now, what you've been able to do uh, as a field is to be able to test it at home. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and we look uh, certainly. Ho however, yeah. with the women exception, are not as good at getting diagnosed yeah, and with that. And with comorbid yeah. lung disease, actually, yeah. sometimes it's better to go in the lab. I yeah. will say, yeah. in your populations is probably the populations we tend to so do more in the lab yeah. because of the overlap of not of yeah. something called hypoventilation where I'm not getting enough of my acid out and I'm not breathing enough oxygen in that's a little harder to tease out with a home study yeah. but so it's always right appropriate but I, to ask I think when we yeah. started the discussion today we talked a little bit about oxygen being such a great drug mm -hmm. and I, I think what we all see as the you know downstream what happens to our patients is that they can develop pulmonary hypertension and yeah. certainly your sleep population is at risk and so yes. diagnosis of oxygen needs is paramount mm -hmm. it's so important yep. and and we need to be uh, paying attention uh, as patients and as physicians to w that we're meeting those requirements too yeah pulmonary hypertension is high blood pressure on the right side of the heart most people know about blood pressure that they take with the blood pressure cuff but this is something that would have to be diagnosed uh, most likely by an ultrasound of the heart. Um, but the symptoms can be shortness of breath, getting winded with exercise, it can uh, be more swelling of your legs, and can be more common in women. But I want to go to a condition that is very unique to women, and that is pregnancy. And I'd like you to uh, tell me a little bit about um, what you would do if you had a patient who was pregnant and short of breath, because I don't know any woman who has been pregnant without a little mm -hmm. sensation mm -hmm. that they can't catch their breath. I would think more about uh, the possibility of asthma in these patients um, as opposed to COPD, so changing gears a little bit, because many of these women have not had a long history of smoking uh, prior to their pregnancy, so I, I think we would consider asthma as a possible diagnosis. Um, Reflux disease, which yes, can really point. mimic shortness of breath and yep. cough. Um, yeah. uh, but I think, and I always think about clots. <laughs> yeah. I think blood about clots all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Blood, blood clots. clots. So yes. pregnancy increases your yes. risk yeah. of having a blood clot right. that can go to your lungs and yes. give you a real right. sensation of right. shortness of breath and can right. be quite dangerous right. if not picked up. I guess right. what's important in asthma too is that if you start out and you go into your pregnancy and asthmatic, right? Yep. If you know you have that problem from your childhood or your teenage years. So the history is Right. A third of you will get worse. <laughs> A yeah. third of you will stay the same, yeah. and yep. a third of you actually will get better. The law of thirds right. that apply but, to so many things. Right. <laughs> but we have to know that, and it's very important to know and regulate it, once again, because what's the biggest problem is oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. right. We're worried about the mom, yes, because the oxygen level will get low, and then we have to be dealing with that. And yes, we worry about the baby, but we're really worried, focused on the oxygen needs of the mom. You know, it's interesting, though, in terms of pregnancy and interstitial disease, this probably plays mostly into these autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. So if you're a rheumatoid arthritis <laughs> patient or you're a lupus patient or you're a scleroderma yeah. patient, then these obviously there's some risk. Uh, there's certainly risk in the diseases that only affect women, right. although the literature goes back and forth on this. We say that diseases that are only in women may have more of a hormone effect, mm -hmm. right? And so when they get pregnant, their disease may get worse. But 
I don't think the verdict's out, whether the, whether it's absolutely true or not, but I think certainly we have to be aware of the initial, uh, you know, the the initial risk associated with being pregnant. Great. And, and take the symptoms seriously. So it, it sure. could be yes. any number of yeah. reasons yep. or conditions, or it could just be normal physiology and normal pregnancy right. too, but I think the symptoms matter and yeah. and that women should should sort of listen to their body and take it seriously. Especially if you have a, if you have a history of asthma, right. um, or if you have a history of pulmonary hypertension, or if you have a history of, you know, cystic fibrosis. Yeah. You know, if you if you're having worsening symptoms, get help. Yeah, because treating asthma during pregnancy improves the outcome of the baby, right. mm -hmm. how healthy they are when they're born. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens during pregnancy is some women develop sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's very important if you're having trouble sleeping, everyone will say, oh, yeah, all pregnant women have trouble sleeping. <laughs> but you want to think about and talk to your physician if you're having trouble with snoring suddenly, mm -hmm. um, you're really more tired than you should be or than your friend or your sister or somebody who was pregnant, um, and really sort of have somebody tease that out for you because that could be diagnosed pretty early, and treating it really is also very helpful to the baby being born more healthy. Absolutely. Yeah. Sort of as we think about this and wrap things up. Is there anything in particular you want to think, gosh, I want to make sure if I could say one thing to folks or I want to make sure that one or two things are really important, what are your sort of take home messages? Start down there. Non-smokers can develop lung cancer and symptoms of cough and shortness of breath are non-specific uh, and should be appropriately evaluated. I, I absolutely would say that shortness of breath and a dry cough should get you to someone who can help you and that you shouldn't ignore your symptoms um, and that I think as we look forward we will have treatments for a lot of the things that I currently don't have the, the recipe for. And in the case of asthma and COPD many of those conditions are highly treatable mm -hmm. um, so my couple of take-home messages would be to advocate for oneself that, um, especially women in the um, demographic areas we were talking about, um, advocate for themselves, seek care, um, ask for opinions that are needed and wanted, and then um, smoking cessation yes. is just so, so yes. important. Um, I think and everybody, yes. I think we yes. all yes. would agree with that. Condition. I, so, uh, smoking and women do prevention, well with it. they do well with it. So smoking cessation. <laughs> Oh, don't start. But I think the other thing that's important is that, um, you know, the way we approach tobacco treatment, right? We, it, it's not uh, a habit that you can't break because you don't have willpower. It's not that you're lazy. And this is a, an addictive drug, probably the, one of the most addictive drugs uh, that are legal. I mean, it's a legal drug. You know, cigarettes are legal. Mm -hmm. and, this, nicotine. and Nicotine. And the cigarette is a brilliant device to deliver a very addictive drug because it's absorbed immediately and it gets to all parts of the sponge and the, and the tubes. So we have to think about tobacco treatment and counseling and, the, and this is a disease. So if you have high blood pressure or asthma, we're going to do these tests and we're going to give you these medications. But here you are you know, a smoker, which is a chronic disease, and we tell you to go quit. Here's a 1-800 right. line, call yeah. it. No, it's really a disease, and I think people do want to quit. It's incredibly difficult to quit uh, smoking because of how potent this addiction is. But we should probably also say that the American Lung Association in most communities have these uh, smoking yes. cessation yes. programs, yes. as well yeah. as a lot of yeah. the local medical mm -hmm. schools. So if you're looking for a place to go, it should be pretty easy to find right. it. And that the and combination of counseling yes. and, and medications yes. and part, and if someone, had, the history, is someone in your home smoking? Because doing it together, it yes. probably has more of a benefit. And don't quit yeah. quitting. Yeah. If you fail yes. before, don't quit. Just it takes the going. average person yep. numerous times before they finally quit. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and women in particular have a hard time. Uh, more so than men in stopping smoking. So keep keep trying. Keep trying. Just keep trying. Setting a quit date being yeah. maybe the first priority. Yeah. Then. Yeah. And lots of rewards. I'm a big believer. <laughs> Short term goals. Let yourself yeah. get your clothes clean. Yeah. Your carpets yeah. clean. Yeah. 
your car like just I'm a big yeah. believer in small goals you yeah. achieve that and then you pick your next goal yeah, yeah. love yeah. it love that's it. great mm. wonderful yes. so I think all in all we would say thank you first so much for joining us we'd also like to thank um, Warringer Engelheim, Genentech, and Synovian for helping to make this possible. Yes. Um, they helped to support this so that we could really get the message out about lung disease um, in women and the differences. And as our main take home message is, remember, women in particular pay attention to your symptoms. Don't ignore them. Um, if you feel like you're not getting answers, feel free to ask specific questions is a certain test appropriate it's always okay to ask the question and then secondarily remember that you need to follow up and that disease processes are different for men and women and they affect us differently and that you know as a healthcare provider and a patient and as a team we all need to work together to, to find the right treatments agree yeah thank you thanks thank so you. much thank you thank you, so much. Thank thank you, you very much thanks guys thanks so much thanks for, for having us, us.